is Alan Good. I'm uh, a fan of Good Intelligence. We're a uh, London based analyst and consulting firm. Uh, we specialise in, uh, we specialise since 2009 in mobile security, mobile authentication, and latterly biometrics. So that's our, that's our bag. Um, I'd like to first of all uh, get the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Andrew. I'm Andrew Budd, I'm uh, founder and CEO of iProof, uh, a company, a London-based company, four years old, specialized in providing extremely simple and secure authentication using face biometrics. Um, in a previous incarnation, I was founder, CEO, and chairman of Mblox, which is the world's largest provider of application-to-person SMS. And I was one of the founders of the European mobile industry, but I've been doing iProof now for like four years. So I'm also, as it happens, the Global Chair of a Trade Association uh, called the Mobile Ecosystem Forum. Jesus. My name is Jesus Aragon. I uh, work for Hodges Labs. I manage the international business. Uh, I've been all my life in mobile, so pretty much relevant since the old Nokia days when uh, before the world changed and, and moved everything around. Um, and then I moved to, uh, to mobile with biometrics. Um, I, I was with a uh, very successful leading voice by magic company called Admitio. Admitio is part of this event as well. And I originally moved to Hodges Labs. Hodges Labs invented BOPS, biometrics, open protocol standard. This is an IEEE standard for biometrics and to end authentication. Uh, and it's very relevant because what you do today, uh, authenticated on the mobile, has to be transferred to uh, like a service. And how you do that transfer is, uh, is key, right? Especially when, when, when it's based on biometrics. I'm Adrian Kelly, Chief Product Officer for Valid Software, a multi factor authentication provider. And, and biometry, what we focus on is voice, as the, the, the biometric aspect of what we do. But I'd echo some of what's been said already around it's about a very context and very sophisticated um, authentication solution you need to provide, um, if only to make sure that the cost of actually the fraud is driven up, because it's, it's, it is a risk. If you make it more expensive to um, Deliver the fraud, then you actually, it's part of how you actually defend yourself as well. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to set the scene um, from getting data from our analysis and our work in this business for the last uh, seven or eight years, and then we're going to go to a, a panel discussion, um, getting the expert kind of opinion um, from the, the panelists, and then we're going to go into a QA session. So, I'm going to start off, just start off really in terms of the why mobile? Why mobile is becoming a, a dominant device for, for authentication. Um, and what we're seeing really is, is, is two connected mega trends. And the first one is the rise of mobile computing. Um, it's, everyone has seen the rise. Everyone by you know, 2020, the GSMA is saying everyone by um, 2020 will have a mobile device or, or access to a mobile phone. So ubiquity. And also the connection with the cloud and SaaS services. So with the move for, and there's tons of data to back this up in terms of the, our personal, our business, enterprise uh, services are going to mobile. Um, legacy authentication really wasn't or isn't fit for purpose. So um, Angel mentioned about you know, use of passwords. Um, uh, it, it's the case of being or tr attempting to authenticate ourselves uh, using either OTPs or passwords or other kind of clunky, cumbersome kind of authentication mechanisms isn't appropriate for mobile. And we're talking omni-channel as well, and the movement towards accessing services, digital services on other devices. Um, you may have seen Amazon's Alexa or Amazon's Echo service, which is a, a voice-based um, um, device available in the US. It's, uh, I mean, you can use it, it's connected into, into Google services now. So. Um, with the things, with connected cars, with um, wearable technology, then if we want something that's going to fit, is fit for purpose for all those devices, um, then, then traditional monolithic authentication services aren't really appropriate. So, and we'll talk about some of the 2FA. But, but also, we've got to be very cognizant to the fact that we just cannot move to new platforms and drop what we have. I think basically the need to support legacy IT is, is very important. So we can drop in new authentication identity services into um, existing IT. So 
leverage what's already there really is the mantra that we've seen with the movement towards mobile-based authentication. So as you can see from this uh, picture here, that mobile without any specialist authentication and identity sensors, and specifically we're talking about biometric sensors here, has a, a variety of inbuilt capability um, that people, the authentication platforms and authentication services can leverage. So camera, the facial and uh, eye biometrics, um, obviously the liveness issue is something we need to consider there, um, GPS and cellular, so there's a lot of data that, the, that we, and this perhaps is connected to behavioral analytics as well, behavioral data, there's a lot of data that uh, is captured from us from the use of our devices, so cell data. Um, and it's uh, a business that, uh, that uh, the, the MOs, the carriers are getting into in aggregating this data and making it available so we can get a picture of, of person's behavior and that could be fed into, into the risk of analysis. But touch screen, um, behavioral analysis, how we interface with, with our devices, how we use them. Again, that kind of building up a profile in the picture, which is very important in continuous authentication. Uh, the microphone for the voice biometrics um, with, with HD quality, both um, with, the, with the, the, the chips and the devices, and also the quality of, of, the, of the communication, 4G and, and, and beyond. You know, it, it's getting it's getting much more accurate. Um, and then embedded biometric sensors. Uh, we work with um, some of the largest uh, mobile fingerprint or fingerprint um, sensor manufacturers. Uh, uh, building out of the mobile and also the software companies that uh, do the matching and verification. So, and you know, really, it, it's been a, an amazing since Apple and um, quite authentic and put touch ID on phones. There's been a, a rush. So now it's a case of you're looking. I think and I, when I when I um, look at some of the tech papers out there, if a phone doesn't have a fingerprint sensor on it, then it's marked down. So it's becoming it's becoming a must-have accessory and an item. Um, whether the big question mark is whether it provides the service providers with the enough level of assurance and accuracy and performance um, is another question. But but it, it, it's there and available, and it can be used and factored into into authentication solutions. And um, Iris Biometrics, Fujitsu uh, produced uh, the world's first Iris biometric capable device for uh, use with Docomo in Japan late last year, and that's a fighter. Uh, late last year, so and then there is, I think, a possibility we will we'll see more um, iris capable devices out there uh, in, the, in the next 18 months. And emerging uh, biometric technologies like um, heart rate, ECG, um, being able to pick up a phone and then we're going to get us through the touch screen um, by, by, by um, authenticating our ECG. But also moving around the clock. Um, device fingerprinting, again, cellular data, IMEI, IMSI, SIM data, and other hard white data that can give us a level of assurance of a service provider, a level of assurance that it is a, it, it is a replica device, it's not a bot, and that it's, it's, it's tied to uh, a particular user. And then the, con the connectivity aspects of these, as well as the cellular, as well as Wi-Fi, we have the short range radio for NFC and, and Bluetooth low, and Bluetooth low energy. And another part of the trusted component is the trusted execution zone and the TEE. So you can have a great level of assurance that my biometric data, my credential data is stored in a, in a, a not quite FIPS 140 level 3, but something near to that, something that gives us a, something similar to an EMV card in the phone, in the hands of, 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 of people out there. So, and also the SIM secure uh, enclave and element. So it really is the perfect kind of mechanism, perfect kind of platform for providing a very, very good um, level of assurance and from for identity. So moving on. Um, at the moment, in terms of what we have, the, the, the main thing that we have with, with mobile at the moment is uh, one-time passwords, either soft tokens generating OTPs um, or SMS delivered um, using two-step verification. Um, and really, OAuth standard has been adopted by a lot of the big technology companies, Google with Authenticator, and uh, Facebook ID, 
um, LinkedIn, all the social networks, um, and the majority of whether people use them is, is another matter, but it's there and it's available. So that, that's the kind of the, 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 the big uh, the, uh, use of um, mobile-based authentication, but obviously there are other, other areas that we'll go into as well. So, not as fancy as Summer's Angels um, 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 graphics, I apologize, it's, um, uh, it, it's a bit, bit analog. But, um, so what we have is um, the combination of what's on the mobile to what it can connect to. So, uh, Angel was talking about RBA and risk-based authentication. Um, also, the, the link to Identity Federation, risk management systems, enterprise mo mobility management, EMM, and the, the connection to the, the trusted platform on the device itself, um, network-based behavioral analysis, um, standards-based auth authorization, threat intel and protection. So what I'm trying to get over in, in, in this slide is the fact that it, it's not just what goes on in the mobile. The mobile is, is connected to a variety of services and networks that make the, that make the phone, uh, again, a, a very good platform for, for, for authentication. And track, uh, talking about standards and, and standards initiatives, what we have as framework is things like Open, Open ID Connect, SAML, GSM, GSMA Mobile Connect, um, the FIDO Alliance, and uh, as was mentioned before, IEEE 2410 BOPS, which is the Biometric Open Protocol Standard. And again, leveraging built-in security, the mobile including the biometric sensor. Um, talk about biometrics, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge growth area. It provides that the convenience factor that user-based authentication. We have a variety of um, kind of biometric modalities that we can, we can plug in and use. Um, voice, iris, facial, behavioral, even ear, using the capacitive sensors on, on, on a touch screen. Um, haven't seen much evidence of that, but it, it is available. Eye vein or, or, or periocular kind of um, biometrics and fingerprints. And you know, I mentioned before we're getting ubiquitous with fingerprint sensors. Um, one of our forecasts is that we're getting um, by 27 over a billion mobile devices with fingerprint sensors. And these are touch sensors. So they can go into the, the front, they can go into the side, they can go into the rear. And the next kind of generation of fingerprint sensors will be within the glass itself. So remo remo removal of the button. And with stuff that thing, uh, like Qualcomm and a company called Sonovation are doing as well with their, um, their latest uh, Snapdragon chips, we're getting ultrasonic fingerprint sensors, which means, again, we don't have to, the user doesn't have to kind of uh, place their finger on a, on, a, on, a, on a particular button, but they, could, they, they can just move it on, onto the back um, and it'll, an ultrasound will read the finger. So technology is coming, accuracy is getting better, uh, price and performance is getting better as well. Um, the question mark is how service providers um, leverage the device-centric kind of biometrics uh, solutions. So that's a kind of a, uh, a quick kind of um, catch-all with the use of mobile authentication, its adoption rates, and also looking at some of the kind of the biometric technologies available. What I'd like to do now is to kind of um, ask panelists some, some questions, um, kind of related to um, this area. So the first question I have is, are mobile authentication services provided by the mobile uh, major platforms and social networks good enough for business? So we're talking about social network IDs, things like Google Authenticator and, um, and the Facebook ID. Andrew. The feedback that I get from service providers who use some of these services is they're not. Uh, they, they, they convert brilliantly, but they're being provided by organizations which in general are not authentication service providers. And therefore, uh, the quality of service that they sometimes get is very poor, availability can be very poor. And most importantly, in a number of these, the service provider, the, the, the offering service provider, has lost control of the credentials. We have to distinguish between authentication service providers, which I think we all are, and identity providers, which is what things like Facebook Connect are. Once a service provider, uh, a mobile commerce site, for example, allows login using Facebook Connect, they have lost control completely of that credential, and if Facebook ever chooses to cut them off, they are dead. 
So there was a business model issue, which I won't go into, but the methods of authentication that are provided are actually extremely primitive. And they are today extremely vulnerable to a point that I will come back to again and again, if you'll give me the chance, Adam, which is that as soon as the device is compromised, and as soon as the credential is compromised, they become incredibly vulnerable, totally vulnerable, to forgery, to spoofing, on a, on a scalable basis that is terrifying. So I don't in any way cast aspersion over the competence and certainly not of the execution of many of these companies, but I don't think that at their heart they are authentication service providers, and when the, when the crash comes, it will be quite horrible. Jesus? Yeah, so, you know, the Facebook Connect may, may work for all those 20, 30 different sites that you want to get into that you don't care about, right? <laughs> but for the, for, the, for the important stuff, it's about identity, right? Uh, again, we have a username and password problem. Uh, I, I, do, I do have uh, a problem with username and password, but it's not about username and password, it's about identities, right? And, and the only way to guarantee identities is with biometrics. You can say that this person was in London in this street and authenticated at this time and, this, uh, and did this transaction, but unless you don't request biometrics, and again, you can get a, a, up to the 99%, like Angel was saying, there is, there is no guarantee that, 100% uh, guarantee that a person is you know, a, a person, right? So, so those things are broken from the identity uh, perspective. Uh, maybe someone that is closer to getting it right or, or that got accepted was Apple ID. Uh, and, and of course, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trust you know, Google or, or, or Facebook to just tell them what I'm doing on a daily basis and where I'm going and what I'm authenticating and what I'm buying. For some reason, I trust Apple more than any other, any other entity. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but again, you know, if, if my bank allows me to get into my bank with, user, uh, with a fingerprint, you know, I, I do it. Uh, talking to Andrew, you need to read the T's and C's as well uh, of the bank app saying if you use a fingerprint to get into your app and do something and your device is compromised, you're liable. So read the T's and C's. Maybe I should, uh, you know, but, but, I just, should read that. Yeah. Just, but, um, yeah, just to interject, but, but, but if I'm, you know, if I'm, um, if I'm given a choice as a consumer between, and it's a small, uh, website, I've, uh, it's an e-commerce site, I've, 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 I've never done any kind of um, transactions with them, and I'm given a choice to set up a new credential or use my existing Facebook one, then, you know, I think I'm going to think, hmm, Facebook, they're a pretty big company, they're, they're, they're going to understand security, I'm, I'm going to use that. The, the creation of, the creation of uh, cross-platform identities is a classic, is, the, is a problem which is of creating a classic two-sided business model. Creating two-sided business models in which the, the consumers won't sign up unless the, site, the websites sign up, and the websites won't sign up unless there are lots of consumers to sign up, is an immensely difficult and expensive task. There, are, there is a bevy of startups who have blundered out into the market saying, we're going, to do, we're going to create an alternative to Facebook Connect. We're going to create a universal authentication passport. And if you're not... If you go into the market that way, and if people dream of doing that in that manner, they will crash and burn and have done, not because it's a bad idea, it's, a, it's actually a very good idea, but because it's an unspeakably difficult and expensive thing to do from scratch, and the business model, frankly, isn't there to make it happen. I'd say a couple of things. To me, incentives always matter, right? So Facebook's incentive, all the social media sites' incentives is to gather your data. And, and laterally, they've been pretty upfront about that, and it's to their credit. So their incentive is to gather your data. It's not to secure your transactions for their sites. Exactly. Um, but we've also got to talk, frankly, about users' incentives. And they want, the th I mean, like Rag, I've said it brilliantly, uh, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I must pay for something. And I, I know nobody wants to wake up in the morning saying, I must securely protect myself online at all times. The incentive of the user is to make life as simple as possible for themselves. So if the business creates the incentive for the user to actually consume a simple logon process, then the business has got to, it should inherit the risks of that. So I guess the way to turn it around and um, to maybe add to this conversation is if a business allows people to log in through these social identity um, mechanisms because they aren't that secure, they should inherit the risk associated with that. Mm. And I think then that squares a circle, that makes it fair. Because it, but I'd be interested to see if in the all case that that's true. And I know that the social identity networks themselves 
don't do that because there's a very famous case of a, an Australian researcher who s systematically um, hacked all of their different two FA systems, That's often, right um, often through the very simple mechanism of forcing a, the, 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 the OTP or whatever it was to be sent, for instance, to a compromised SIM or to a voicemail system that he'd hacked and harvested that way. And when he told each one of those social media um, sites about this, they talked about it being the mobile operator's fault for not securing their systems. And then the, the mobile operator sites, mobile operators would approach it, well, this isn't designed to be a security mechanism for a third party. Yeah. So you, you, yes. the point about that federation, you're falling between the gaps. Yeah. I would suggest that, that the Facebook Connect, the big social network login, is actually an obsolete model. Because it's solving a problem which is going away. Remember that when you log in using Facebook, you log in using uh, your Facebook credential. Nobody has problems with credentials. I don't have any problem remembering the usernames that I choose to do. And then an authentication. What Facebook have done is they've taken the password problem, the fact that we can't remember all these damn passwords, and they said, all you have to do is remember one password, which is mine. And by doing so, by offering that opportunity, they seize control of the credential. So there are always two boxes on a Facebook login. When you make the authentication process very simple, which I think biometrics does, you remove that obstacle completely. And now people can log in using their own usernames, use onto that service, onto that server, and then they can just use biometrics or some other ultra simple solution to log in. So the added value of logging in using a Facebook Connect thing goes away, and a lot of people don't want to, to, to tell the world about all their activities. When you log on to a site uh, using Facebook, you've got to use your genuine Facebook identity, which Facebook says has to be identity. You're telling Facebook and you're telling the site exactly who you are. Now, there's an increasing, a large number of people who wish to be able to live their digital lives under a series of different pseudonyms where each of those pseudonyms can, be, can actually have quite a lot of trust associated with it, but they do not deign to give those pseudonyms the full real-life know-your-customer identity that in reality only, only banks and financial institutions need. People value trusted anonymity and these sorts of centralized uh, identity providers totally destroy that. And in return, all they've done is to, make the fa is to simplify the number of passwords you have to remember. But if you no longer have to remember passwords, yeah. what's the point? And that's why I say I think they're actually legacy. So what's the difference then between banks kind of rushing to leverage Touch ID and, and, and Samsung or, and, and Google um, biometric um, ecosystems? In terms of... So again, it, it's, a, it's an identity which, which is not owned by a service provider, but a service provider is having a level of trust that Apple, Samsung, Google, Huawei, ZTE, well, this is, Xiaomi are, are doing something right. This so, is so. an inter interesting question because when Apple launched the iPhone with the first fingerprint sensor, the government just got excited and saying, you guys are messing with biometrics. Uh, what are you guys doing with people's personal data, and yeah. they wrote a 20 pages document sure. saying, oh, don't worry, we have a secure element and everything is encrypted. You saw what happened like a month ago in, in that uh, shooting in, in LA, right? Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to give us the details how to decrypt the iPhone, and Apple said no. And then, the iPhone, I, I need, I, I, then I said, I need to follow this news, right? And then two days later, uh, the government said, oh, you know, we, we already hacked it. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, saying that we do biometrics and then we, everything is secure because we have a secure chip on the, on the device. Don't worry about it. And then you see this news, then I need to reconsider using Apple, and, you know, uh, anymore. But I, I think what we're going to see is that uh, I think the, the issue of liability and trust is going to lead to the deconstruction of this identity blodge. I mean, the way that we do it with iProof is we say, Mr. Service Provider, you establish the level of trust that you wish to have with that customer. When you've established that level of trust, pass them across to us, we will associate a face with that, and every time that that person represents themselves and we verify them using their face, you can infer the same level of trust that you had when you enrolled them. A bank 
demands a different level of trust yeah. than an e-commerce site, which may be different from a, a, a business information site. These are business decisions that each individual service provider has to make. That's why the concept of identity, the moment that you start becoming an identity provider, you start taking on liabilities, which in reality are as high as your most secure customer. And that implies all, most, and that implies all sorts of issues to, when dealing particularly both with the consumer and with uh, service providers who maybe don't require that same level of trust. So it's an, inefficient, it's an inefficient business model that needs to be deconstructed, and I think that's the way it's going to go. I think what's important to think about, though, is the system. So no bank is saying Touch ID is all we're, we're using. Um, and I think that's part, the other part of this that doesn't get service in these debates. Everybody focuses on, oh, it's, Touch ID is what protects me. Well, it isn't. It's, it's, it's an element. Whether, you know, whether it's a factor or not, you can make that religious argument, but it is an element. Mm -hmm. But the banks will have analytics, the banks will be using other data and context coming from the device, from the networks, etc. So we, the only way to answer that question, honestly, is to really understand the full implementation of what the bank, an individual bank is doing. And, and I hope that it, it, this is just one element of it, and that they understand the, the value of that element and the weighting you place on it versus other elements and how you make the, um, the system secure. And the other thing you need to think about in this is that the conversation about the business and the system value around authentication. So in other words, the way the bank thinks about it is, what's the balance I get in terms of ease of use for my customers, volume of business I get, therefore profit I get, versus fraud I'm exposed to? That's their calculation. But as an individual user, I'm thinking about, well, are all my transactions absolutely safe? Or if there are a problem with my transactions, do I get fast remediation from my bank? There, you know, there is a point where those two things do come into conflict. You need to think about that as well. We, we also have to watch out. We've, everyone's focusing on banks. Interest, banks are very serious people, but banks know that they can tolerate a certain level of fraud. Banks acknowledge that their business model permits a level of fraud that is, let us say, 1%. They can take that. Large enterprises, healthcare providers, cannot permit a 1% level of fraud because it tears their business apart. 71% of all cyber incidents, according to Trustwave, in enterprises arrive, from, uh, arise out of weak access control. So all you need is 1% of your, of your accesses to be fraudulent. Can you imagine if you're a major corporation and, and only 1% of your accesses are fraudulent? You are dead. It's the same talking to healthcare organizations. If only 1% of accesses to personal private records, to personal health records, are fraudulent, that's acceptable? No, it's not. So in a way, the banks are not necessarily the ultimate benchmark for the level of security that is actually required within the economy. And we'll notice that in most places, not even the banks will allow you to do something sensitive using Touch ID. Note that they will allow you to look at your account, but certainly in the UK, not a single bank will permit you to create a new payee or to change your personal credentials using Touch ID. I know with interest, uh, lots of ads on the London Tube at the moment for a certain spread betting firm that are touting the benefits of spread betting via Touch ID. <laughs> but, got a, but again, it goes back to incentives. They've got a different incentive. I have, to, I have to declare an interest. I'm a non-executive director of a spread betting company. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. F FCA, re FCA, FCA regulated. One of the reasons why the issue of authentication and the strength of authentication is becoming such a topic now, and it wasn't three or four years ago, is that three or four years ago, the issue of authentication sat somewhere deep down inside the IT organization. I sit on the risk and, on the risk and audit committee of, 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 a of a regulated financial services organization, and I can tell you that this is now a board issue. And that's what's, that is what has changed. Does, doesn't that mean it gets a little bit complicated for the users? So, you know, okay, Touch ID or, 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 or Samsung fingerprint is okay to open an app, um, but it's not good enough to create a new benefit, beneficiary or to perhaps uh, uh, to request that my GP sends me a, a new prescription. So, and then I have to go to something else. So before we had, so we're, we're creating inconvenience with it because we're trying to get to convenience. So aren't, aren't, we, aren't we adding... You know, we're talking about infinite, inf do, infinite uh, authentication. But I don't, I mean, this is part of what's changed in the debate. I don't think previously we were trying to get to convenience. No. We, were, we were trying to secure something. Yeah. I, and I think yeah. that's one of the things that we're trying to change now. And to your point about um, touch ID versus this versus that, I think what is now changing is there's much more thoughtful debate about service design, security service design. Because um, one of the things we've got to do is if we make it appropriate and logical for people to do what they're doing in a particular context, 
the chances are they will do that. I mean, Raghav touched about that in his talk, the collaboration thing. You know, because users will weaken awkward, difficult systems. They will do it. And they're being rational in what they do. We've got to stop criticizing the end user and the weak passwords. The system is at fault, not the user. Can As I we're moving it? forward, I think we can, and we are now starting to think more thoughtfully about service design, because the tools we've got in play mean we can square that circle, if you like. We can maintain security while improving the user experience. I think this issue of service design is absolutely fundamental. One of the things that I learned in the different world of mobile payments is that users have both a, uh, a, a desire and a tolerance for different levels of ceremony associated with different levels of importance. If I'm doing something very simple, not very critical, low, which I perceive as being low risk, I want it frictionless. I want no ceremony. If I want to look at my bank account, I want to touch the thing. I want to touch it, and in a quarter of a second, I want to be in. But if I'm starting to pay somebody new or get access to my personal records, I, as a consumer, as a user, know that that matters. And tests, user tests show people want a sense of ceremony to, confer, to reassure them that not everybody can blunder in and get access to that sensitive information. Tests were done on early background voice biometrics, uh, which many of you will be familiar with, where people were being allowed to do very sensitive things on the basis of background voice biometrics. It scared the hell out of people because they were saying, what is this? Why aren't you checking that I am who I should be? So there are low value, low, ri low perceived risk um, activities for which the consumer knows there doesn't need to be much trust and they just want it to be out of the way. But when they do important things, they actually desire a sense of ceremony to both as a reassurance that something important has happened. And that's why you need different, different types of user journey, different types of service design to meet those two needs. Yeah. It's putting grit into the... I, well, no, I disagree, because there's a difference, and we make a very marked difference. We have intellectual property on this. There is an enormous difference between, as, between a visible ceremony and something that is a pain in the neck. You can make, we have made, extremely easy, effortless, fun, zero effort, zero cognitive load, active ceremonies for people to go through. They don't have to do anything, there's nothing gritty or frictional about it, but they see it's there, and they need that for a, for a, for a, for a for I think it, an interesting analogy is where um, NFC payments have been rolled out, even pay, like chip, chip cards, and yep. enabling of the payments of those mm -hmm. cards. And what, you've, what you see happening there is an inevitable um, lifting of the, the, the limits. Uh, I think in the UK it starts, I can't remember if it's 10, 15 or 20 pounds. Mm. 30 now. But it's now up to 30. 30. Yeah. And, and it'd be interesting to see where that actually lands, to your point about the yeah. ceremonies. At what point will both banks and the consumer be comfortable? Do we get to 50? Do we get to 100? I don't know. But it's an interesting almost experiment, live experiment as to that point about where, you know, where people want to see that ceremony kicking in. And it's happening live right now. I, th I think before you get from uh, 20 to 100 or 2,000, I think the bank is going to have to roll out other attributes, like in you were saying, yeah. like other yeah. biometric factors and, and, and account for, for the risk, right? Because yeah. I, at the end of the day, it's about the risk that, that the, the, the user is going to go through. Okay. I think we've got, what, five minutes left? Yeah. I think. yeah. Five minutes left. So I would like to invite the audience to ask any questions and uh, generically or specifically to, 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 to a panelist. Yeah, I think there, there's still a debate, and I am interested. I heard some expression of it, but this notion of I own my ID, it's bring your own ID. Mm -hmm. And we, then we hear this discussion about the financial institutions, they'll be the identity providers, centralized, and you know, um, and there'll be a single entity in the clouds that will handle IDs. Where do you think this is going to end up? So I'm going, to, I'm going to slightly hijack your question, if I may, because there was one topic that we were going to talk about which really, really, really matters that we should talk about, which is, which is whether identity and authentication is fundamentally lying on the device or in the cloud. That, I think, is, is one of the most fundamental questions that we have to address. And even if we're running out of time, we should address that. And that's part of what you're saying. <laughs> personally, personally, I believe that all of this has to run in the cloud. Identity has to be in the cloud, and it's absolutely essential that, that authentication runs in the cloud. I think, the direct, I think for, to, for toy authentications, low ceremony, low risk authentications, things that don't matter too much, it's jolly good to run it on the device. But if it matters, it is extremely reckless to run so, it on the device. So, so, so to load on that one, 
you know, I think the, the real danger with on devices is that it's the enrollment process is uncontrolled. Yeah. I would disagree, and, actually. And, 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 you know, that enrollment is, is the beginning of the identity chain. If it's not controlled, I see a lot of services allow self-enrollment, and that scares yeah. me. I, can I disagree? I think the real risk of running off on the device, if we're talking about biometrics, the key threat to biometrics uh, is not how good your recognizer is. Everyone gets distracted by that. Mm. The real threat to biometrics is the use of forgeries because, your face, because everything, faces, fingerprints, ears, they're all public credentials. They're public. There's nothing secret about them at all. So trying to keep them secret is actually a complete waste of time. The real risk that people face, that service providers face, that consumers face, is forgeries. Forgeries really, really are dangerous. And therefore, the core technology today in biometrics is forgery detection. You put that forgery detection on the device, what you've done is you've provided the hackers with an infinite laboratory to keep on experimenting with your forgery detection until they find its exploit. And when they found its exploit, sir, you are dead. Because what has happened is that you have created an infinite fraud mechanism People have a zero cost, unlimited means of defrauding you because they have found out how to get around your forgery detection. And since uh, once you're around forgery detection, the system is open. And that risk of distributing millions of, millions of systems which have zero day exploits built into them, which are non-visible and unfixable, is to me unsafe. That's my big problem with, with, with device-based authentications. Especially fingerprints. I mean, I'm not sure you bought anything there. I, I, well, I, I have to declare an interest. What iProof has done, we have invented a technology called one time biometrics, which uh, turn a face into, which uh, stamp a face with a one time code, a uh, one time optical code, turning it into a one time password, a one time, excuse me, a one time biometric. Therefore, in the cloud, we use extremely sophisticated and entirely opaque technology to determine the validity of that one-time biometric. And even if the hacker breaks in and gets, wanders around our systems, which he's going to have struggle to do, it's going to be quite expensive. Frankly, he'd rather wander around somebody else's systems. Um, he's not going to steal anything worth doing because, like any kind of one-time, like any kind of one-time credential, everything that's stored in there is obsolete anyway. So the and the great thing is, if you do things in the cloud, and I guess Jesus, you'll agree with me. If you do things in the cloud, you can see every attack that is mounted against you. You watch them, you detect them when they are not if they're successful. You see them when they're successful, and you learn from the attackers, and you can heal the exploit. So you know when an exploit has success, has succeeded, and you can fix it. That's the important thing. You can't, you, that's what you've won. You've won the ability to, to spot successful exploits and to heal them, and you don't have that on the that's device. where you think it should go. Where do you think it will go? Mm. <laughs> with with fire. I mean, I, I see. Good point. Yeah. Well, I just, if I could come in. So there's, you talked, to, the original question was about where, where identity belongs. So, and this touches on that, but the other side of this, which we haven't touched on at all, and I'm not directly answering your question, but um, it does link to it very strongly, which is mutual authentication. So far, what we've talked about is the, that the end user presenting themselves to some entity that there's an implied trust of them. How do I, as a user, know that I'm dealing with somebody? And this came up in some of the talks earlier, but that's going to be key as well. And the reason I bring that up is in terms of deciding where this lands, how do you start to create situations where both parties can start to have identities that can be trusted? And, and, and where does that end up? You know, that's something we really need to address as well, because that's going to get increasingly complicated. The more life gets digitized, how do we actually know that this entity on the other side of this transaction is who they claim to be? That gets to be really, really difficult. Can, can, can I make the point? So the reason I, I founded iProof was that we used to be the world's largest provider of mobile, uh, of, uh, mobile of merchant acquisition and mobile payments, and we got defrauded. Mm -hmm. And when we did the security analysis, what we found is neither side could actually trust the other. Mm -hmm. And so the question was, how do you produce an authentication mechanism in which it doesn't matter that either side can trust the other. I can't trust that the guy I'm, to I as the user can't trust the fact that I'm talking, exactly as you said, that I'm talking to somebody that I think mm -hmm. I'm talking to. And of course the service provider can't trust anything at all about the device because the device is undoubtedly being compromised, um, if not completely cloned. So the key challenge that we've got is actually not establishing that trust, but actually operating in an environment in which we can't trust each other. And that's <coughs> a, a, a serious technical so problem. Which the, the, and you say, will it succeed? The answer is, 
who will succeed, the, the, the organizations that will succeed are the organizations that successfully solve that problem. So, so, so there, are, there are three ways of doing this. Either you have a, cent, a device centric approach, you have a server centric approach, you have a distributed centric approach. If you, and you know, nothing is perfect. If you have a server centric approach, you have to store templates uh, on the cloud, and this, is, this goes against privacy, privacy issues. Unless you I, can I, generate, I, unless, unless you can generate uh, a password out of a template without having a template, that's amazing. So that's the holy grail. You, you just, uh, you did it. You did it. That's, <laughs> that's, on, on our systems, <laughs> we store no more information than is actually available on LinkedIn or Facebook. Okay, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's a lot of data. All right. No, I mean, faces. <laughs> <laughs> Pictures. If you have a device-centric approach, uh, you know, some, something like Fido, for example, um, I mean, if I get, if, if, if a hacker gets a device, it's gonna hack it, it's gonna take a day. And it's gonna get, the, you know, trusted execution environment, everything is encrypted, Look, talk to the FBI, talk to all the hackers. Give a phone to someone and it will get hacked and it will get your data in like a day. Now, can this scale to all Samsung Galaxy 6 out there? Probably not. Uh, or probably, you know, with software virtualization in Android, I wouldn't do it on the, on the device. So. Uh, on, 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 on the Bob side, on the, on the IEEE, what, what, what they end up doing is, let's partition the system so when you create a template, and it doesn't matter what biometrics you use, encrypt it, cut it in two halves, one half stays on the device, one half goes to the server, and then let's match, let's match on, the, on the server, for example, if this is what you wanted. And I agree that you know, having it in the cloud is, is better than, than anything else. And touching your point as well, touching on your point that uh, when you enroll on a device, how do you guarantee that it's you who is enrolling there? This is a big problem. So this is also part of BOPS. Uh, there are mechanisms, and they, they call it genesis, right? So when you, uh, when you enroll, you need to have a verification done somehow. And it could be an SMS to your mobile, it could be as simple as getting an email to your account and just click, or it could be going to a bank branch and say, this is my, this is my uh, passport, verify me, click on it, then enroll. So uh, without you, those things, biometrics won't work. It's, it's not a problem of the enrollment of the biometrics, is what I said earlier. The service provider has to go through some process to establish a level of trust with the user. Yeah. That's the service provider's task. And they've got that problem today. That doesn't change anything. It's merely that when they have accomplished that once, and it can be painful to the consumer, then if you enroll the user contemporaneously in with a biometric system, at that point you can use the biometrics to simplify the process because you can infer that same painfully earned level of trust again and again. But if you kind of go, well, biometrics somehow mysteriously creates trust, that which I know has been one of the huge sources of, of fraud associated with Touch ID in the United States, that's not a, not a clever way to go. Um, Are we out of time? Yeah. Are we out of time? Or we are out of time. And, and this is very fertile, once again. So mm. I hope we figure out a way to, to keep talking these through. Because um, in a funny way, it raises more questions than it answers. <laughs> <laughs> it's the beginning of a journey, isn't it? Which, which is perfect. Uh, okay. Can I just invite people, if they want to see what a one-time biometric is like, <laughs> go and download the iProve Verifier from Google Play or, or the App Store. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Thank you.